So our next panel, is, as I said, going to be about blockchain applications explained. We're going to hear about real user cases of projects, development, technical insights to what DLTs really are. And I have myself the talented Lana is here, and uh, she's Chief Research Officer of Glassnode, uh, talented mathematician with experience in creative approaches to data science and crypto currencies and blockchain. I'm sure you're all going to enjoy. Lana, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, so today with us uh, we have Matei, he is a computer scientist of Ecole Polytechnique of Laval. Uh, we have Pierre, he's a founder of a cyber security company, Arcadia, and Bitcoin Miles, their standards also out there. And Aparna, a specialist from Berkeley and Mechanism Labs, uh, a specialist in distributed consensus. And because we have such interesting speakers with us today, we shall slightly deviate from the initial uh, topic that we announced. Uh, may we have our slide, please? Uh, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, what we will discuss is fundamental principles that unite blockchains, weaknesses, uh, how those weaknesses may be exploited, and also different consensuses and how they can be used in real use cases. Uh, Matei, can you please start with uh, telling us about fundamental principles of blockchains? Thank you, Lana. So, uh, I would like to start to uh, bring everybody really on the same page as a very broad audience. And uh, we will really focus more on the explain part of the title here. So, uh, just to have a few words about what the fundamental principles are that originally blockchain was about and still to a very big part is about. It's, I think it is important to realize at least at a high level how the technology works and uh, thus be able to better assess which applications it is uh, meaningful to use it for and which applications are totally okay with some centralized solutions and they do not need a blockchain because there's plenty of these too. I've, I've heard many, many things, even today, where people put this on the blockchain, put that on the blockchain, and the blockchain solves all the problems. Well, it does solve some problems, but not all the problems, and for some problems it is helpful, and for some problems it is not. So, uh, there are really rather few fundamental concepts that underlie uh, the basic original blockchain. Uh, it's on the left of the slide, we have, we have the concept of signing and verifying. That means, first of all, if I want to have some transaction or some general operation, I need to make sure that it's me who did this and that the others are able to verify that, uh, that I signed this transaction or operation. So, in this sense, it is public that everybody can verify what I signed. Then, in order to establish an order of the operations that are happening, we use we use the principle of chaining these events. Each event is in some way chained to, to the previous one, such that we really can establish which, which event happened before another event. And everybody has a consistent view of this. For example, in, even in the very, very first blockchain uh, that got very popular, which is Bitcoin, the chaining means that everybody sees that one transaction is chained to the other, and if the, other, if, the, if the second transaction wants to spend some money that was uh, already spent by the previous transaction, then everybody knows that the second one is invalid and should not be accepted. Now, many people can have different opinions what the state of this whole system should be. And we need to agree on something. We need to have a global view on what is actually happening and we need to agree on, on this. So, this is what voting is for. And in many implementations, there are various approaches to this, but in some sense, it's always that the participants of this protocol vote for which, uh, for, for what is the reality that everybody should be sticking to. Now, we cannot have anybody vote however they want, which is uh, probably too, uh, familiar to most of you, the same as civil attacks, 
where I can pretend to be a million people and vote for something and then overvote somebody else. So always the voting needs to be backed by something that makes sure that uh, my vote is actually genuine. I call it working here, which is the proof of work in, in Bitcoin, but it can be something else. It can be, uh, we can have other proofs, we can have proof of stake, which is also some kind of working. I work to get some stake and then I use this stake to, be, to have voting power and so on. And then, uh, in, the, in the very end, I need to be motivated to do this work most of the time, for which I get some reward. And in Bitcoin, this is, this is, uh, this is implemented through minting new coins, whatever block is bad, for example. But there, there may be many ways. And really, a blockchain at, at its very fundamental principle is just this. For, for, from some point of view, and many people would disagree, but uh, I think it's a viable point of view where we, we, have some, we have some transactions or operations that are signed and verifiable, we chain them together, we vote which are valid and which are not, we have the voting backed by some real world resource or by some real world thing, uh, such that nobody can vote infinitely many times, and we have some rewards for people who, or for, for participants in the protocol. And these are the fundamental underlying principles of the vast majority of what we call blockchain. Now, there are many developments and uh, there are different variations of the blockchains, but most of them are traceable to really these uh, basic principles. So when we talk about blockchain, when I talk about blockchain now, I mean something that adheres to these principles. So in my view, this is the, the fundamental view of, of a blockchain. And now we can see what we can do with it and what we cannot do with it. Thank you very much, Mati. Um, so on a perceptional level, we often associate the word blockchain with trust, with uh, transparency. Um, uh, but obviously there are weak points um, in blockchains. So um, can you guys elaborate please on uh, which of these provide uh, weak points and which kinds of So just one second maybe, and then I will, I will uh, let somebody else talk about this. So I think there are many tags on pretty much every level. You can, you can have uh, social engineering attacks in the in sense of stealing keys from people and impersonating an e-commerce to that. You can have uh, hacks in how to, how to exploit your work more than others and so on. There are, there are hacks in creating forks, preventing people from sending messages and so on. So this is really, really attackable for many points of view, and this is where the implementation is different. So I think you have, you have some uh, more particular example of where, for, where you can get that. Yeah, maybe before speaking though, we'd like to explain a bit of the principles. Yeah, I think I'll pass it to Okay, so um, I guess the way I look at <laughs> blockchain consensus uh, so 2018 was a year where there's so many different blockchain consensus algorithms that come about. How do you go about comparing consensus? Um, well, one way I like to think of it is in this four-step framework, starting with proposer and committee election, which is basically who has the ability to create a block, um, who has the ability to verify this block that's created in an honest manner. Um, the second stage is sort of propagation of blocks, which basically means um, how do these blocks go from one person to the other? Does everyone talk to everyone? Is there an up upper bound of time that it takes for these blocks to get through the network? What does that upper bound look like? And all these subtle properties lend, lend the blockchain to have different use cases. Um, for example, if there is an upper bound of time that the consensus is used, then that in and of itself can um, can only be maybe used for like a permission blockchain or like something that's connected by fiber optic cables. But on the other hand, if there's no no upper bound in time, that's perfect for a decentralized payment system. Um, the third really interesting and subtle property that's different between blockchains and traditional consensus protocols is this concept of finality. So, Matei will probably elaborate on that in a sec, but uh, in blockchains, you trade off this 
guarantee that everyone will come to an agreement on a common view. Um, you say, okay, maybe with some probability we will all come to agreement on this common view. What that probability is depends on the consensus mechanism. Um, now, based on that, you get to have different properties. So there's this really famous theorem that states that in the case of like a power outage or like a network partition, you can only have um, either everyone has the same view of the blockchain or the blockchain itself keeps growing. So depending on what consensus, what this consensus blockchain algorithm chooses to do, you can have different use cases. So for example, you can either have like a live streaming gaming application that needs the blockchain to keep growing. It doesn't necessarily need everyone to have a common view. Or you can have like a payment system and the payment system would probably need this guaranteed concept of finality. Um, and the fourth interesting <coughs> principle that I think blockchains have is this concept of handling churn, which basically means the idea that the people who are trying to come to consensus are different. So in traditional consensus, you have this concept that at, before the execution of the consensus algorithm, everyone, uh, you know who all the participants are who are going to come to consensus. But in a blockchain system, that's not necessarily the case. The people can change over time. And based on that, you can either lend yourself into having uh, a decentralized application like Bitcoin handles churn really well. Like at any given point of time, a miner can leave or join. Versus um, maybe for a permission use case, you know well ahead of time who the participants are who are trying to come to consensus and you don't necessarily need to handle churn. So this is an interesting framework that I like to look at all kinds of consensus, be it blockchain or not blockchain in. Uh, just a little question uh, for Aparna. Uh, if you could simply define consensus, would you define it as 100% agreement between everybody or just a numerical bound of how many people have to agree? How would you simply define what is this? So consensus, I guess in a blockchain sense, is more just um, with what probability do most nodes see, the, uh, see a common view of the world? So consensus is basically just a number, 90%. Yeah? Okay. At least in blockchain. Can I for a second strongly disagree with you? Because, sure. Because uh, I, I'm coming, um, I'm at a university and I'm coming from more from the academic research background and consensus is a very precisely defined problem. And uh, in fact, the vast majority of the blockchains do not solve consensus as it is defined in the, in the scientific literature. A consensus problem is, as defined by the distributed algorithm theoreticians, is a, is a very specific problem to solve, which, mean, which, has, uh, which means that each of the participants has some, some, let's say, opinion, which is an input value, and the problem is to have some mechanism of all the participants agree on one of these values and all of these participants presenting this value at the end. And so, there are three properties. First, everybody needs to output the same value. Second, the value that is output by everybody has to be uh, one of the values proposed. And third, nobody can take forever. So everybody eventually has to output the value. So this is, this is consensus as as defined by the distributed systems, uh, by the distributed algorithms community. And this is a very well accepted and very well defined problem. Now, it turns out that, uh, due also due to a very famous impossibility result, that, that in a realistic system that is asynchronous, this problem cannot even be solved deterministically. That means even if everybody is obeying the protocol, nobody's cheating, nobody's lying, everybody is present, it's sufficient if one participant can turn off their computer and not turn, never turn it on anymore. It, in this situation, solving consensus is impossible, that's true. What, what blockchains are doing is to try to circumvent this issue and uh, 
finding other, other problems or finding solutions to slightly different problems that, that, that uh, do not suffer from this impossibility result. So technically what, what uh, blockchain, what, what Bitcoin was doing, what most of the blockchains are doing is not solving consensus as precisely defined uh, by, by scientific literature. Now in the Byzantine, in the so-called Byzantine model where, where uh, we assume that processes or participants can also be malicious and they can lie and so on, this gets even more difficult. And uh, there is the so-called Byzantine agreement problem, which is very similar but still slightly different. And uh, most of the, most of the um, I dare say, pretty much none of the, of, the, of the algorithms used now don't really solve precisely this problem. They, they go around it because the problem as it is defined has, has no solution in a realistic scenario. The solution that exists, it might be practical and it's very useful to have them, it's just not really the solution of consensus. And one, one more little word that, that, that I, that I uh, heard uh, you say before, which is the, you, you said that the finality is especially required when you have a cryptocurrency. Well, I think Bitcoin and related clones of it are the, the prime counter examples of this. We have a huge cryptocurrency with billions of uh, dollars of value and uh, none of these systems actually provides finality. Or none of, there are many of these that do not provide consensus finality. That means if I have a transaction today, I send you money and I do not have a very, very, I, I have a strong probabilistic guarantee that this will not be reverted, but in the sense of scientific reasoning, this is still not what, what finality is. Okay, so this is the fine line between theory and practice. <laughs> um, okay, so since we started talking about the fallacies of uh, blockchain and Bitcoin, uh, Pierre, can you please tell us about the uh, hack example? Yeah, certainly. So I, I've been working uh, for about 20 years in hacking into system and defending and detecting uh, the offenders of hacking in, in systems. And there's a very interesting property of uh, proof of work that's applied in Bitcoin network. And the reason why it brings a very close or near finality to uh, some work. So for example, if we take uh, the nodes we see in the background of the image here, um, I believe I'm colorblind, but I would assume they're green. They are, yeah. So, uh, meaning in this case that they all agree on a certain consensus to a certain degree or a certain level of finality. The difference with uh, a proof of work network versus other ones or other um, structures or mechanisms to arrive to this consensus or so to say. <laughs> um, it's okay, I don't get offended. <laughs> no, no, but you're right, it is not, and I, I, I agree with what you're saying. So, in my experience, hacking all those nodes all at the same time by one malicious person is within the realm of possibilities. The range of cost for that would cost 200000 to about $2 million investment with a good group of criminal hackers. Mm -hmm. And this brings uh, criminals in a position to be able to revert transactions uh, on these networks. Um, the difference with proof of work is uh, they cannot do so without redoing the work. So it is possible, but then you need to uh, do the work again and then you could um, silently change the blockchain on the majority of the nodes uh, without people realizing it. <clears throat> but you need this hashing power, this spent of energy to do it versus other um, structures where in this case a uh, hacker could actually change the pass uh, without people noticing. And I quite often get the question, the, the remark that, well, we have backups. Yeah. But then, who's telling the truth when 90% of the other nodes think that the green is actually the hacked version? So this brings the points and the arguments and the questions as to uh, where, and, where and, and for what we want to use those blockchain. And uh, we see the market doing a really good job at this. For example, uh, Bitcoin as a main network is starting to uh, appear some 
uh, side chain or side networks, such as a Lightning Network is not as secure as the main chain because you need to, uh, you trust that your future transaction will settle in the main network, which is pretty much guaranteed, but it's still at the lower level. Or if you take Liquid from Blockstream, works with a strong federation of nodes, then we trust that those nodes are working properly and as agreed to. But they, in theory, could change their own blockchain sidechain in this case and uh, revert transactions in the past. And then there would be this uh, chaos of determining which of the two is actually the truth and which one we decide to follow. So uh, this uh, is the point I wanted to bring that uh, is quite often overlooked at. Uh, could you maybe elaborate a little bit on the uh, impact of a very massive hack and uh, the risk that uh, blockchain compromises can pose in the modern world where we apply blockchain? Yeah, and I think uh, my peers can as well. The most obvious one is money. Uh, right? I want to steal money, I get someone to, uh, I pay someone to say $10 million or $100 million and then I get the goods, and then I revert this transaction, and I keep the money. So that's the easy one. This is where we see the, the survival of the best blockchains uh, bringing the best, the, the highest value. Right? So that's why Bitcoin is the highest value at the moment. It's because the other ones haven't proven themselves. But we, I hear a lot about medical records uh, or uh, insurance or all sorts of other applications. Well, we have to think about the impact of it is possible that someone's medical record could be tempered with, depending on the structure that's been chosen uh, to work with. I just had one small remark because I found it interesting uh, where, where you said that uh, you don't know which, which chain, when there's a fork, and, uh, and uh, like both branches of the fork go for quite some time, then uh, it is very difficult to choose which is the true fork. So I think this is actually, you can even see it as a purpose. Because there is no truth. There is just two forks and everybody can decide which fork, they, which branch they will vote for. So, and this is, this is both the strength and the weakness of uh, blockchain based systems. That you do not have a central institution to trust that in case of uh, the participants disagreeing, you can go somewhere, you can go to the central bank, you can go to the government, you can go to the court, you can go... You do not have this and you do not have this on purpose because you might not trust these institutions. What if, what if you hack 100% of the node and then you erase completely one branch? There's no more copies. Well, then you won. <laughs> then, then, you, then you kind of push through your version of truth and, and then you won. And that, that's the risk also of using blockchain technology, that you do not have this authority that sometimes you would actually like to have, and sometimes you don't want to have it. it has, it's, it's not black and white in this sense, oh, we don't trust any authorities, so we have blockchains. Well, this is a price to pay for it, and in many applications, this is the thing you want to have. And uh, uh, many applications profit from this many good applications, many bad applications too, well, bad, which, which I guess most of us would consider bad, like, I don't know, uh, drug uh, trading and uh, illegal weapon trading and so on. This happened a lot on the blockchain because, because there is no authority to trace it. And they kind of need to give this up, but uh, they have their advantages. And there are many other applications that, that, are, that profit from this, but this is also when we always need to bear in mind that this is, uh, this is an inherent property that if we don't want to put the trust in some authorities that we agree on or some, in some other way like elections or something like this, then we, we need to put the trust somewhere. And in such uh, open and uh, permission assistance we put the trust in those that are currently using the system. And if those uh, break our trust, then, then we lost. We need to bear this in mind. I don't say this is necessarily always a, uh, a big problem, but we need, we need to be aware of this too. 
and that, that determines where we should and where we should not use the block. Uh, Pierre, could you also uh, elaborate a little bit on the difference between um, having a malicious worm, for example, uh, infiltrating different nodes, uh, for example, 51% or 80% of the nodes and rewriting the blockchain, or um, just having, uh, just owning a huge mining pool that has more than 50% of the power, because it sounds quite similar on the first side, but what's the in internal difference? Yeah, okay, so um, the problem we're mostly accustomed to is the social one, where there's either a uh, majority of the network who ends up in the control uh, of the chain, which then can perform some censorship. It doesn't mean they don't do the work, they actually do the work, but then they can start choosing uh, what work uh, they put in the blockchain. So in this case, being social and uh, live is typically easy to, to see uh, on a running blockchain being open, everybody else verifies, and then as this attack is happening, then others can witness it and announce it. The difference in, uh, let's say, a worm takes over um, a, a big majority of the nodes, then uh, change uh, could go unnoticed for actually quite a while. Um, in the case of the proof of work chains, I don't think it's viable and economically viable. I mean, to a certain degree it can be, but it could go unnoticed. That's the big difference. And also, it can change things in the past versus the other one. Um, well, actually, it depends on the chain. So it can happen uh, as it's going and also change in the past, depending if there's proof of work or not involved. Thank you. Um, and one more thing that we didn't discuss with Aparna is uh, different types of consensus and uh, how these consensus affect uh, the, um, not the other way around, uh, your use case that you have and how that affects the choice of consensus. Yeah, so definitely like when you start to think of different consensus, app, uh, consensus models that exist, your proof of stake, your proof of work, even with all of these, you have a difference in terms of what the finality conditions look like, what the propagation conditions look like, what the handling churn conditions look like, and all of these kind of determine what use cases you can build on top of these. So for example, if your consensus cannot handle churn, um, which is like what a lot of traditional consensus is, um, then you probably cannot do what Bitcoin is doing, which is be a global decentralized currency. Similarly, if you run a lot of like traditional consensus algorithms at the scale of what you're running Bitcoin, um, you definitely cannot reach any sort of agreement in a, in a quick time period. So it doesn't scale very well, um, which is where you sort of have to make these trade-offs with respect to uh, what, what you're willing to give up a little bit of just so you can have something else at a larger scale. So for example, if your consensus algorithm has a very, very strong assumption on like the time that it takes for messages to go from one person to another, there's no way you can build a decentralized currency on such, a cur uh, on such an algorithm. But on the flip side, maybe if you have a permission consortium of people who are running nodes within like a small country or something, maybe that's a good enough consensus mechanism for you to use um, for maybe like a banking use case between seven or eight different banks. Thank you. Uh, are there questions from the audience? Because we have a few minutes left, please. Uh, I would like uh, to get back to this finality issue. Um, I, I heard that the topic, you know, from the Bank of International Settlements, it happened to be here. And they were basically telling uh, Bitcoin is a scam because there is no finality. But is there any, you know, given this very narrow definition that you actually give for finality, is there any payment system that has this finality properly? I don't think so. I mean, the, the, the normal payment system that we have, you can reverse right. any transaction at any time. The, the value here in Bitcoin, it's funny because we had a, a slide up, uh, is that you need to redo the work. 
and that costs a lot of money. So for example, at the moment, if you want to rewrite the whole blockchain for Bitcoin, it would take the entire hashing power in the network at the moment, and you'd need to run it for 250 days or 300 days per about to rewrite history. Oh, I, I, and so there's a cost to it. Given this narrow definition of finality, basically you exclude everything in my view. There is nothing, there's no payment system that, that fits that, that definition. Well, finality <clears throat> in the technical sense, makes a lot of sense, but uh, when we are talking about almost in this philosophical level, uh, in payments in general, then, then we would have to again define what, fin what finality is in this sense. It, on the technical level, level of protocols, it is rather easy to define. But not useful. It, sorry? But not useful. Yes. Well, to some sense, if you, if you had a protocol, and there are protocols that have, uh, that have finality, they just don't scale to so many number of nodes. But if you if you have some some private blockchain that uses some some scalable enough protocol that has finality and there are uh, can revert everything in a private network in a private uh, well but not blockchain, at the, you can revert everything not at the level of the protocol at the protocol if something happens nobody can deny that this happens and of course we can agree okay this happens in the protocol but now we stop using the protocol and we, we revert to something else in order to not not look at what the protocol is doing that's another story. But it's the level of the protocol, so the protocol you do have it. I also think finality is less of a binary thing, more of a, there's a degree of finality, so you can compare different protocols on that metric. Um, so for example, if you're doing a payment use case, you might want a higher degree of finality than if you're doing another use case, which doesn't require that. So like you can compare consensus mechanisms on their degree of, like, how expensive is it maybe to like change whatever block was added to the blockchain? Or um, what kind of resources would an attacker need in order, like what kind of computational power would they need in order to revert blockchain A versus blockchain B? I think you make a very good point here. Yeah, thank that you. Uh, we are out of time, unfortunately, so we can continue this conversation outside. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.